I've had people cry in the office for just that reason, because they didn't realize how irritable or unhappy they were feeling or how they were treating other people until they felt better. Yeah. Welcome, Dr. Greenblatt, to the show. I'm so happy to have you here. Your work is fascinating to me, and um, I'll try not to keep you all day. <laughs> Great. It's good to be with you. Yeah, so Dr. Greenblatt, you've written several books all on um, psychiatry and the gut-brain connection. Well, not all of them, but several interesting topics on Alzheimer's and anorexia and binge eating and ADHD and schizophrenia and depression. And I want to understand from you the, the impact of your, um, I guess, specific kind of work, how it's had on people's lives and, um, you know, what brought you to do what you're doing today. You know, I think in the field of psychiatry and mental health treatment, there's just been these huge gaps in, um, in, in our knowledge base and, and the, the practice of psychiatry has kind of forgotten that there's a net connecting the body and the brain. So we have the psychotherapy community, we have a psychopharm community, medications, and there's this kind of black hole in the middle of looking at what's happening in the body and how it affects mental health. And that's been our work over the last 35 years. Yeah, it's amazing work. Um, I've worked in the alternative or holistic health food industry and you know wellness healing industry for a long time. And your work I find so incredibly important because you know when you're working day to day, seeing people struggling and trying to find answers to why do I feel so bad? So whatever the bad is, you know? And, and I remember this one gentleman um, came into my healing center years ago and he was in his 70s and he had only recently been diagnosed with ADHD and started to attend to his health of his body and he said with the right combination of you know everything working together he had no idea how he was supposed to feel and I think a lot of people experience that same kind of thing right? Absolutely when we kind of help optimize someone's mental health, whether it's a nutritional supplement or fixing the gut. I've had people cry in the office for just that reason, because they didn't realize how irritable or unhappy they were feeling or how they were treating other people until they felt better. Yeah. So Dr. Greenblatt, I really want to talk today about mental health and depression in particular, um, but just mental health in general, because it is such an important topic. I, I work a lot with mental health and emotional health and the combination of those two things. But this this brain-gut connection, explain to us in as simple as you can for the layman's terms, how how it works and why it is so important. Sure. I mean, I think, you know, you mentioned the word depression, I think to put it in perspective, it is the number one cause of disability worldwide, globally. Mm -hmm. So it's not diabetes or arthritis, it is depression. So it is both epidemic and the repercussions are obviously tragedy in terms of suicide, but also life that's just um, impaired. And our current model of just medications have, uh, the research shows it's just limited, the outcomes are not great. So looking for other models and understanding the gut, it, it's not the answer to everyone's depression, but it's uh, one of the missing pieces. So our work involves nutritional deficiencies, lifestyle, including sleep and diet, but abnormalities in the gut, and that could be anything from uh, not diagnosing celiac disease, uh, gluten intolerance, which causes depression due to uh, nutritional deficiencies, and or just inflammation in the gut can create depression. So there's probably three or four different avenues where, you know, a problem in the GI tract could contribute to depressed mood. So I, I know that there's a large percent of serotonin that is created in the gut. Is that correct? Um, the estimates are maybe 90% of the serotonin in our body is oh, wow. made in the gut. Wow. And uh, well, let me share one fascinating story is the uh, vitamin D. Um, people think about it for bone health, think about it for immune function, but vitamin D is the, uh, a required cofactor for serotonin synthesis. Mm. So there's this beautiful mechanism that if you are deficient in vitamin D, your brain doesn't make enough serotonin, but your gut 
makes too much serotonin, creating inflammation. So it's just a, a mechanism of how vitamin D deficiency contributes to depression by decreasing serotonin in the brain and causing inflammation in the gut. Wow. Well, there's, there's so much education that, you know, I, I'm fascinated by it. So it's a real interesting topic to me. And I, I'm sure our listeners are as well. Just curious about, you know, in the gut. So, well, first, the first question that comes up is, I know that we've become a society of quick fixes and we, you know, just want the pill. We want something to fix us. We want something to change overnight. If a person attends to their gut health, um, whether that be inflammation or uh, I don't know if you believe in leaky gut or not, but I'd like to talk about that in a moment, um, or imbalance of bacteria or the immune system, what have you, how long would it take for a person to see results in their mood and their state of depression if they were to really balance their gut health? Sure. I, I think it's um, some of the nutritional deficiencies like B12, people feel better you know, within 30 days. Uh, hormone uh, deficiencies, people feel better in a couple months and vitamin D could be a few months. I think some of the gut inflammatory uh, markers takes longer. And that's why people need to work with clinicians who understand the relationship and can heal uh, a leaky gut or inflammation. So it can be longer, but it is kind of foundational uh, for individuals to um, have a healthier uh, foundation for mental health or improve their mood. Well, I would assume, as you said, it's healthier just overall instead of taking medication every day to get the this um, system that's working within us uh, 24 hours a day functioning as best as possible. And and the medications, you know, don't work as well as we would hope. I mean, the efficacy is is 50 percent. You know, placebo is almost 40 percent. So it's not like we have this quick fix alternative that works well. Patients are struggling because our current model is not that effective. I, yes, and I know a lot of people who struggle who've tried so many things, from the ketamine therapy to um, different, uh, you know, antidepressives or anti-anxieties, and so many different things that, as you say, they're just not um, as effective as one would like. So let's talk about what creates the issue in the gut in the first place? Is it strictly diet and what we're taking in? What what actually creates the problem in the gut? You know, I, I think um, anything related to mental health, we always have to use the word complicated because we just don't understand everything, but we could start making a list of many things, um, everything from stress, you know, which stress has major implications for, you know, turning off the digestive system, which means you're not digesting food, making you more prone to leaky gut and creating deficiencies of acid and other things. So everything from stress to food allergies to what we call dysbiosis to uh, like a high um, use of antibiotics can create uh, abnormal gut bacteria. Mm. And that can create this inflammatory process to uh, change mood and behavior. Wow. So I would assume that a person that's had maybe even a very sugar laden diet, or as you mentioned earlier, not being diagnosed with something like celiac, um, just not having the correct digestive mechanisms for the everyday kind of things that we're intaking over time could create a really big problem, or maybe not even over time. Maybe it's more of an instant thing. Does it happen quickly when we intake something and then have a... a for some people, most of the time, it's kind of an accumulation. Our body has this incredible ability to adapt, you know, to junk food and everything else. But but over time, the the nutritional deficiencies, the blood sugar abnormalities, the, you know, insulin resistance. I mean, there's a whole host of metabolic problems that eventually will affect the brain. The, you know, the brain is our most metabolically active organ. It's only a few pounds, but it's utilizing a quarter of our energy. So deficiencies and abnormalities will affect brain function and mood. Yeah. Well, as a psychiatrist, what led you to even start to explore the importance of the gut health? Well, I, I went into medical school thinking I was going to cure the world with brown rice and kale. So I had that interest. You know, I came out as psychopharmacologist uh, nine years later, but very quickly realized that patients weren't getting better. 
So it was relatively easy for me to go back to the reason I went into medicine, looking at the relationship between nutrition and brain function and helping kind of uh, determine the puzzle. And it's challenging because everyone's different, but the outcomes are so much better. Yeah. Well, I want to share, before we talk about the leaky gut and some things that we can do, I want to share something, just a personal story that maybe you can even clear up. Because honestly, I, you know, I think things like this happen to people a lot. I struggled a lot with um, constipation and from all of my childhood, from stress and from eating the wrong foods. I, I've been gluten intolerant and finally in 2008 stopped eating gluten. I remember I had this experience where I was... Um, in a class and I was, I stood up to perform and what felt like anxiety, um, it was a, a, a very strong wave of anxiety, like the room was spinning kind of thing. And, and it really took me to my knees. I had to stop and I, I had to go down and I was freaking out. The ambulance came every, you know, it was a humiliating experience. But after about an hour, that after an hour of that happening, I ended up going to the restroom for literally almost two hours straight, just constant movement. And after the fact, I felt like that there was some pressure that was hitting my brain somehow, you know, causing this anxiety, but it was coming from this backlog of, um, you know, digestive issues that hadn't been relieved. Is that possible? And do people experience that kind of thing with either anxiety or vertigo or what have you? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, the big term might be, you know, it's a two way highway from the brain to the gut and the gut to the brain. So, you know, we talk about a nervous stomach, um, so we can feel it in our gut, but the gut is constantly communicating to the brain as well. Um, and uh, so between nutritional deficiencies and, and gut bacteria and all the complexities around emotions, um, it is that two-way street. So absolutely, we see the results uh, and the effects um, uh, in many different ways. Yeah, it's, it's completely fascinating. In your work with ADHD, um, is it the same kind of information that's traveling from the gut to the brain or is it what what happens what's the effect on adhd or even alzheimer some of these other uh, big topics that are of course very interesting important for people in relation yeah. to gut health and and i think the challenge when we we look at a integrative or functional model for mental health is that um everyone's different and and the goal is to kind of discover what's going on so for an adhd child you know, a food allergy to, you know, wheat or eggs or dairy could affect behavior or it could be a nutritional deficiency or it could be multiple antibiotics because of ear infections created uh, abnormal gut bacteria that's producing chemicals that we can detect that can contribute to some of the abnormal behavior. So a lot of my work over the years has been detective work. Um, you could have 10 kids with ADHD and there might be 10 different variations of, you know, nutritional or metabolic or gut problems. So mm -hmm. you got to look and, and it's hard to have a one size fits all. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Well, and also in your estimation, I know that this is a probably impossible question to a answer, but I, I'm just curious for a child in particular, maybe a child who's experiencing ADHD or anxiety, because I know a lot of children start to develop anxiety at early ages. What percentage of behavioral or environmental issues are typically more present versus physical, nutritional, and health issues are more present in a child? And again, I know it's probably impossible, but would you say it's about half and half or one's more important than the other? You know, uh, it's probably, you know, I think for a lot of our psychiatric illnesses, ADHD and depression, there's a genetic vulnerability. So there are some individuals that are going to be more prone to it. And then that environmental genetic dance, if you will, will determine it. And, and I'm convinced that about 75% is probably related to these environmental stresses. And it could be you know, anything from heavy metals, copper, lead, to nutritional deficiencies, 
to stress, bullying, uh, but there's that genetic vulnerability and then these environmental factors that include the gut. Mm. Well, is there any one way that you feel is a better approach to eating and health and wellness for the general population? Or is it just, uh, there's no one size fits all, everybody's unique? Yeah, I mean, I think the most important thing is is remembering that everyone's unique. So just because your neighbor got better with this vitamin or that doesn't mean that's the problem. But, you know, I think the the big lifestyle changes around sleep um, stress and sugar, um, you know, I think are huge for mental health. And then from there, it's really kind of fine tuning and, and looking for nutritional deficiencies. They're, they're, they're simple. A vitamin D level is, is literally life changing, um, for mental health. We just don't think about it. And the B12 and B6. Yeah. Well, how, how would you um, suggest a person increase their vitamin D levels? Because I think it's very challenging for a lot of people, especially those who can't be outside, you know, as much in this day and age. Um, what is your best suggestion for increasing those vitamin D levels? Yeah, I think um, ideally uh, to have a test would, would kind of uh, at least once a year would guide you. But I, I think it's quite clear that everyone uh, could benefit um, from at least 4,000 international units a day with food, should be with a fatty meal. But there are individuals you can't look at um, who might have very, very low levels, uh, under 10 we've seen, and they're much more prone to depression, to dementia, and even research suicide risk. So if we can get that baseline test, it does help guide treatment. Wow, I didn't know that about vitamin D. That's very interesting. It's pretty much been ignored in the mental health community um, because the the medications are, you know, driven by advertising and pharmaceuticals, and vitamin D is pretty simple and cheap. Yeah, same with the, some other issues that we're challenged with right now. You know, regarding supplements and immune support, right? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So what, what about um, probiotics? It, does that help the gut system to function better, clear out, and, and be healthier in relation to the brain? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the gut bacteria, um, which are you know, just critical for our health, mental health and physical health, uh, the good news is our research communities are, are doing a lot of research helping to identify this relationship. Um, most people would benefit from probiotics, but there's a subset where we can actually test and find out that this abnormal gut bacteria is contributing to the mental health problem. And that's where we would target very high dose um, probiotics. So there's some individuals that uh, the gut is the, the major problem and testing can help identify that. And then treating with high dose probiotics, again, can change mood and behavior. Wow. Well, you've been doing this a very long time. I'm sure you have an enormous amount of stories from your clients. Is there one or is there one that comes to mind when you think about a person who is really struggling with mental health and that whose life changed according to the gut connection and their nutritional levels overall? Sure. I mean, I have hundreds, if not thousands of stories. Yeah. And the good news is now we're teaching other doctors. So I hear their good stories. So we're, we're talking about them every day. But I mean, some of the most common ones would be uh, some of these kids that have been uh, multiple antibiotics. They have abnormal gut bacteria, um, have recent cases of um, anxiety and, and OCD related symptoms. And when we tested it, we found out that um, they, their gut bacteria were producing this chemical that was causing the anxiety. So we're able to give them probiotics and, and dramatically change the, the anxiety, their obsessive thinking that impaired their ability to, to get to school and to function. And this was after a trial of many medications. Wow. Now, is that would that only be true then for, is, is there another way for a, the gut bacteria to become so imbalanced or is it primarily just from antibiotics? Um, I know we've seen it again, stress, that two way, the brain to the gut you know, a diet high in sugar, someone with lots of food allergies, someone with gluten intolerance, someone with celiac. Mm. So there are many ways that we're going to create 
inflammation in the gut, that for some individuals will have a direct effect on their mental health. Wow. So if, if let's just theoretically create this person who by and large eats really well, takes all the vitamins, has healthy vitamin D levels, you know, maybe not the best, but healthy, healthy, um, exercises and, you know, in general, let's just say they're overall healthy. If they have an enormous amount of stress, whether it's financial, emotional, relational, whatever the stress is coming from, that stress goes on for a period of time. Is stress alone enough to create an imbalance in this gut bacteria and affect the, the brain and gut access connection? Absolutely. I, wow. I, I, um, I remember in medical school, uh, this acupuncturist, um, Diane Conley, uh, gave a talk and, uh, you know, her example at the time was, you know, eating a McDonald's hamburger, um, you know, uh, versus eating the organic foods under stress. And, and, you know, 40 years later, it's just turned out to be absolutely true. I have um, many patients over the years who are, you know, getting the organic foods and doing everything they can, but whether it's relationship stress, whether it's bullying at school, whether it's just you know internal um, stress due to past traumas, uh, that will wipe out any any kind of lifestyle or dietary intervention. Wow, that's powerful. So then, I guess the next question is, how do we naturally lower our stress, or what are your suggestions? Well, I mean, to me, it's um, you know I use a term, you know, nourishing the brain and nurturing the mind, and, and we need both sides of the equation. So you and I might be more prone to stress if we have a vitamin B12 of 200. So the first step in my approach is to kind of optimize this biological foundation because you can do all the yoga and all the mindfulness and all the meditation in the world, but if you're magnesium deficient or B12 deficient or vitamin D deficient, your body's going to be in a state of tension. Mm. So the nourishing the brain part is optimizing the nutritional support that foundation and then the 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 nurturing the mind would be the mindfulness the meditation the yoga the ability to kind of uh, approach life in a more aware healthy state but if you're biologically out of whack or deficient it's just not going to work so you need both sides of the equation yeah, that's interesting that you say that. I, I used to be the, well, I still am. But when I learned about magnesium, it was after that time, after I, I just shared that story about, you know, having to go to the bathroom for a couple of hours from being constipated. I, magnesium changed my life. And I was, I was young. I was in my 20s, you know, in my late 20s or something. And I learned about magnesium at the, at the school that I went to in California and started taking it. And not only did any kind of anxiety dissipate that I was experiencing, you know, the, the regular stress-induced anxiety, the um, operating system of my digestive tract became so much healthier. I felt more energy and it was just, it was amazing, you know, all for what, $15 a month or something like that. It's amazing. I, I think magnesium deficiency is easily the most common deficiency we would see in a mental health practice. Mm. You know, it, it affects the, the gut, it affects um, anxiety, um, sleep, irritability, and guess what causes magnesium deficiency besides dietary intake? Stress. So if we're under stress, cortisol levels go up, we're excreting more and more magnesium, and it's certainly less Part of our diet due to um, you know the soil, so it is the most common deficiency we see in a mental health practice. Well, so what I've heard you say so far is that um, we can have a perfect diet and do all the right things, and if we're having an enormous amount of stress ongoingly, then it can affect this brain gut communication and create mental illness and also a, a lacking of um, functioning in our digestive system. I also hear you say that vitamin D, B12, and magnesium are some of the critical supplements that people can use to support their body and probiotics for the gut to um, give them the nutrition they need to have a healthier sense of 
well, health and wellness and, and mental health. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. So for our listeners, and I, you know, I, I, I'm going to highly encourage everyone to um, really check out Dr. Greenblatt's work and his books. But if you could share with our listeners, because there's even with that information, there's still so much confusion because there's not enough education around, you know, the holistic approach. And a lot of a lot of people and a lot of um, different societies don't get the kind of information that they need about what actually works. So, for example, magnesium, there's four or five or six, probably more than that, uh, varieties of magnesium. What do you think is the best to treat mental health and this condition we're talking about today? For, for magnesium, I, I think the only rule that uh, I want someone to remember would be um, it's probably best not to take magnesium oxide, which is the least expensive, mm. um, unless you're constipated. So a lot of it's not absorbed and it will kind of uh, help with constipation. So you'd want any of the other forms that are easily absorbed magnesium citrate, magnesium glycinate um, would be appropriate. And I, I think it's really important to find clinicians that are experienced and, uh, and the testing oftentimes can guide a more personalized approach. So try not to just get information on, on Facebook, try to see a physician who can test and personalize the recommendations. Yeah. Are you still in private practice? Right now, mainly training doctors. So we're teaching doctors at our educational platform, Psychiatry Redefined, and doing consultations to uh, with other physicians. But actually looking to open a, a virtual clinic, a national virtual clinic on this um, integrative and functional psychiatry model, hopefully in February of 2022. Oh, that's awesome. And would that be where a person could actually get some blood work done and submit that and work with a psychiatrist and? Yes. Oh, yeah, the yeah. model would be set up where individuals would be able to get a, a mental health assessment and get the appropriate blood work to determine this kind of personalized approach. It's what we've been doing, you know, in our practice for 30 years, we're trying to uh, work with a team of clinicians around the country to make it more accessible. Wow, that's amazing. That sounds like something that everyone needs, and I, I really hope it comes to fruition for you. Um, you know, more and more, and I'm sure you've, you know, you're aware recently, in the past couple of weeks, the the information that's come about um, about the increase in mental health issues in our youth, in particular, but no doubt in adults as well, through this pandemic experience, and and I think just. A, you know, accumulation of what hasn't been addressed appropriately over many generations, probably. So, um, you know, I, you can speak more to it than I can for sure, but is, is there something more that we can do to support our families, our children, our spouses, our elderly in regards to mental health? Well, I, to me, the, uh, the, the rates have had been increasing before the pandemic. Uh, the, uh, for kids, depression, anxiety, suicide, eating disorders. I, I think we've been on a 10-year um, journey. Uh, the good news is people are talking about it. There's more awareness and people are getting help, but there's waiting lists for treatment and there's still not as many clinicians trained in an integrative and functional medicine model. But I think that the real key, again, is that same message of, um, making sure that we personalize uh, the treatment because 10 kids with anxiety might be 10 different approaches. But if we can treat it in childhood, we can prevent many of these tragedies. Right. Um, can you explain for our listeners just briefly what, what exactly is integrative and functional medicine? Because I think more and more it's becoming you know, popular and sought out, but some people still don't understand what that is and what's the difference between a standard for example, in your case, psychiatrist. And a... Yeah, I mean, I, I function or, as a standard psychiatrist. I, I work in hospitals and, and, and train nurse practitioners, doctors. So the integrative just means we're looking beyond a medication model because that hasn't worked. So we, we use medicines when necessary, but we'd integrate lifestyle, we'd integrate diet, and we'd integrate understanding nutritional deficiencies. 
the, the functional word, which I think is just as important, although often confused, it just means uh, looking at the root cause, just what we've been talking about. So functional medicine is, is helping individuals, again, explore the gut, explore infections, you know, Lyme disease or other uh, infections. So a functional approach looks at the kind of genetic, environmental dance, if you will, an integrative approach at lifestyle, and you need both. That's why my term is functional and integrative medicine for mental health. That's wonderful. It really makes so much sense. And I, I love this approach so much. Um, you know, and just a reminder for our listeners, if the gut health, and I know we've been talking about it for a half hour now, but it's responsible for so many aspects of our wellness from our immune system and our mental health as Dr. Greenblatt is sharing with us and just how you feel every day. I know when, you know, when I eat well and I feel uh, balanced and nutritionally fulfilled, you just have a better experience for the day. Um, so it can impact so many things. And I just really value the information that you're sharing with us, Dr. Greenblatt, because it's critical and hopefully just some of these minor changes that people can make can have a vast improvement in their life. So thank you. Yep, thank you. And where can people find more about you? Our educational platform is called psychiatryredefined.org. And that's for uh, mostly professionals, but um, uh, consumers and patients will get a lot of information, a lot of free content. And then uh, my website is jamesbreenblattmd.com. Super. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Best of luck and health and warm wishes for you and your family. And um, we'll keep an eye out on more of your continued work and offerings for the world. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Take care.